This is Dr. Ira Shapira, and I'm going to be discussing common developmental pathways of both sleep apnea and TMD, the developments of altered anatomy and physiology. So we treat people who have TMJ disorders, who have sleep apnea disorders, and the question is always, how did they get here? I want to give special thanks to Jim Gary, who taught me this material originally and whose flowchart I used. I also want to thank Jim posthumously because it's because of Jim that I knew what was happening with my son, Billy, when he was five years old and knew what to do to take care of him. Okay, so consequences of sleep apnea. What are the problems? In 2016, we know kids who have sleep apnea have behavioral disorders, ADD, ADHD, they'll have disruptive behavior in school and at home. They have ODD, obstructive or oppositional defiant disorder. They have problems with learning, with poor grades, bedwetting, depression. They'll have metabolic derangements. Sometimes they're very skinny, sometimes they're obese. Uh, they can have insulin sensitivity, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, chronic inflammation. If we wanted to boil it all down to one thing, they're not happy, they're not healthy. We want to grow healthy kids. So, Chronic TMJ disorders, sleep disorders, allergy problems, they all have a common developmental pathway. And that's what I'm going to talk about. How starting with infants, we end up with adults or adolescents or children who aren't healthy. How these things happen and why. When we talk about genes, we all know about DNA and genes. It's the hardwired material that tells us what we're going to look like. When we talk about a genome, that's what we're talking about, the hardwired genes. But when we talk about phenotypic expression of these genes, it's something different. So the phenome is what happens when the genes develops in different environments. I'm gonna talk about the history of nasal obstruction in children because for over a hundred years, we've been looking at these problems and it wasn't always agreed upon. I would love to say today, everybody agrees and everybody's addressing this at a young age, but it's not true. We are. So everybody here, pat yourself on the back and we're gonna talk about how children's grow, the history of it and where we are now. As far back as 1872, Tomes coined the phase adenoid faces and he described the face changes of people who have chronic nasal obstruction. Chronic nasal obstruction is a huge problem because it changes our development. In 1912, Ketchum said every single kid should be evaluated by a rhinologist and an orthodontist. That part of the development is to see how good is their nasal breathing because otherwise they end up with dental facial abnormalities. That's what we treat. In 1918, Norland came up with his compression therapy. Basically, he said, if the upper arch is too constricted, it's because your tongue isn't pushing it out and making it grow. If we can't breathe through our nose, we start to breathe through our mouth, the tongue is not in the position to cause the maxilla to grow. The pressure changes between the nose and the mouth can also have effects. In 1962, Moss looked at the functional matrix theory and changes due to nasal obstruction. He called the functional matrix all of the tissues, bones, muscles, lymphatics, blood vessels, everything. And the skeletal unit provides for support. So bone will dynamically change. If you put pressure on bone, it'll, it'll, it'll resorb. If you put tension on bone, it'll grow and tongues and muscles can grow and reshape the bone all through growth. In the 70s and 80s, Linda Aronson did 20 years of studies looking at nasal obstruction in certain patterns. 
They looked at enlarged adenoids and the craniofacial changes that take place. They looked at clockwise rotations of the mandible in a more vertical and posterior direction. Elongation of the lower face, but more than that, they looked what happened if you took out adenoids and how their faces were to return back to a normal growth pattern. So this shows it's not genetic, it's epigenetic. It's based on what's going on in the environment. If you can take the adenoids out and these kids can breathe through their nose, they will reshape how they grow. In 1984, and this is one of my favorite doctors, Dr. Miller, looked at the muscles and he said, you know, if we block people's nasal breathing, they start to breathe with different muscles. All of a sudden they're dealing with their, their breathing, using their tongue, their upper lip movements, the dilator nares. Um, and they'll even use muscles like the geniohyoid, the SCM, the trapezius, and they will rhythmically use these muscles to assist in breathing. But after rhythmically using them for a for certain period of time, uh, there will be a chronic shortening or tonus of these muscles. So if we look at Dr. Travell and look, read what she had to say about myofascial pain and dysfunction, when muscles are used over and over again, if they're not used correctly, they will end up with chronic shortening, taut bands and trigger points. Myofascial pain and pain from myofascial trigger points is part of what we see in all our TMJ patients. So just the nasal breathing can change all these muscles and set up a, us up for future problems. Mouth breathing, this was from Cranio in 2014, causes changes in muscle activity. Upper airway ex, um, obstruction leads to forward head postures. When people have a forward head posture, they tend to really have a forward head tilt but then they rotate their head on the atlas axis in order to be able to level their vision. These people who have these nasal breathing problems have sternocleidomastoid and upper trapezius issues. Um, another article in 2001, temporal mandibular disorders related to craniofacial dimensions. Forward head posture, is based on the size of the jaw and the TMJ dysfunction. So there's a cause and effect in both directions. These were young and adolescent children. Kerr looked at what happened if you did an adenoid tonsillectomy. So they looked at the growth patterns in children. Then they did the adenoidectomy for the nasal obstruction. And what they found was they had a return to normal. So if you let them shift back to nasal breathing, they would go back to the initial growth pattern they had. And they did work with monozygomatic twins. So identical twins, and they could actually see the difference between the one that developed normally and the one that didn't, whether it was due, whatever the cause of the nasal obstruction. So cause and effect and reversibility is what we're talking about. Harville didn't work on people, he worked on monkeys, but he'd artificially block the nasal nares of monkeys and he'd get different patterns of growth. The patterns of growth were the same seen in human kids. If they put enlarged tonsil adenoids on one side of the monkey's throat, the monkey would end up with smaller lungs and shorter legs on the side with the airway blockage. They would rhythmically use their muscles to breathe. So they were, this is what Miller's work was. So Harville basically did this on an experimental basis to show the functional and skeletal changes that took place. If you've never read the work of Harville, absolutely positively you should. If you look at the pictures of some of his monkeys, those monkeys look more like the allergy kids than the allergy kids look like healthy kids. Rapid maxillary expansion. If you, Tim's 1986, rapid maxillary expansion widens the nasal airway. 1976, Hershey did the same thing. In decreased nasal resistance with a wider airway. The roof of the mouth and the floor of the nose is the same bone. If you expand the maxillary, you expand the, the nasal cross-sectional width. Principato looked at 211 cases with rhinometry 
and demonstrated that the nasal resistant changed cephalometric measurements of the anterior lower face. You don't have to know all these things, but it's important just to understand the history that's been looked at for a long time. Chang proposed that the impact by nasal obstruction can vary with different types. So some people have a more wide broad face and some people have a longer narrower face and the changes may not be identical, but both can have changes. So treatment, should you take out adenoids or not? Well, several years ago at a sleep meeting in Baltimore at the Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, a doctor from Sweden presented and she said she thought you should do the maxillary expansion, the rapid maxillary expansion prior to taking tonsils or adenoids out. And her rationale was the expansion is very, very quick. And a lot of these kids, if you expand them, there's less inflammation and the tonsils and adenoids will shrink. But more important, if you've given them a better airway, there's less risk of surgery when you do take the tonsils and adenoids out. Should you take out adenoids or tonsils or both? How significant is timing? Typically the adenoids are a bigger problem than the tonsils. It's a much less, there's much less morbidity associated with taking out adenoids. It's very quick, it's very easy. There's virtually no post-op pain. So Sometimes if the tonsils aren't that bad, you may want to consider doing the, taking the adenoids out and doing the maxillary expansion and seeing if the, tongue, if the tonsils will shrink. Again, should maxillary expansion precede adenoid tonsillectomy? I'm going to say yes, unless the airway obstruction is too bad that it's an emergency. Genetics versus epigenetics. So there were naysayers to this saying, no, 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 this is not uh, caused by the problems. So in 1889, Kingsley said, there's normal kids that have severe nasal obstruction. And Whitaker said there were severe palate malformations in people who'd undergone adenoid adenoidectomies at an early age. So they were saying there's problems associated with this and Hinton said that merely opening your lips a little bit and breathing through your mouth can reduce nasal breathing by 50 to 70%. And he felt this wouldn't lead to significant craniofacial problems. Excuse me. Um, so all of these things are important. It's important to note the opposition, but I think the opposition is a thing of the past right now. We know we can grow healthier mouths by working, by opening up airways. Vig showed a lack of a clear definition of mouth breathing. So he talked about, well, is it a full mouth breather or a partial mouth breather? And most people will fall in between the two. So he found that nasal airflow in long-faced lip incompetent patients wasn't significantly different and that surgical intervention to improve nasal respiration remains empirical. So everybody doesn't agree. I'm going to tell you from my point of view, the earlier you give good breathing, the more important. And newer studies have actually shown, forgetting about just the orthopedics, we know that the brain is developing at a very young age. If we get better sleep and better brain growth, even if we end up in the same spot, I think we owe it to the kids to give them their airways. The term long face syndrome or adenoid facies is what we see from adenoid tissue, but everybody doesn't get the same problem and everybody doesn't have adenoids or tonsils. They could have deviated septums, hypertrophied turbinates, external nasal deformity. You should always look at the nares because sometimes you'll see kids whose nares are almost closed completely. Basically, vertical excess facial height in the lower third of the face and the big gummy smile that kind of have a horse kind of smile and a narrow high part arch instead of a wide flat arch. So Dr. Coricini is a game changer for us. He's an anthropologist and an orthodontist, but he went back 400 years and he said, you know, 400 years ago, 
almost everybody had big, wide, broad palettes. This malocclusion we're seeing now is new. It hasn't always been around. And he put causes being inadequate breastfeeding, soft diet, Pe babies weren't meant to eat mush. Orthodontic norms that have been established in all around the world have all been established in the last 100 and 120 years. So the norms are based on pathological numbers because the pathology occurred 300 years before. Um, unfortunately, there's no pictures in Dr. Coricini's book. So it's a slow read, but it's an important read. So all of this was boiled down into a chart by Dr. Jim Gary. This chart was around in 1980, 1982, I think I saw it for the first time. And Dr. Gary explained to me what was happening in my son. So I'm gonna go through this with you. It's a nice presentation. I'm gonna suggest that you keep this part of the presentation. I can send it to you in PowerPoints form to actually discuss with patients because they don't understand how things get this way. And it correlates with the pictures. So the flow chart starts with food contaminants and inhalant allergies. We live in a polluted world. We have sulfur compounds, we have too much CO2. So some of it's just pollution and we already know there can be changes in embryos where they're still in the mother, inside the mother during early development. However, the most common problem is babies fed formula. Formula is made from cow's milk and cow's milk is the perfect food if you happen to be a baby cow. But if you happen to be a human, it's not and it can lead to food, food and inhalant allergies. So this can ch cause changes in chemical mediators, the histamines, the antiphylactic muscles, the, the chemicals, so the kinins. So all these things can change. When these change, it changes what's going on in development. The second thing that can happen though, is if you're not being breastfed, a baby taking a nipple on a bottle, closes their mouth tight around the bottle, and then they get milk by going up and down opening and closing their mouth. When a baby's fed mother's breast, basically they put their whole mouth over the breast, they push their tongue up against the nipple and flatten it against the palate. And then they rhythmically will drop the tongue downward and then push up again. And this rhythmic movement causes the expansion of the maxilla. So this we know, Jim Gary had an excellent article on it in Morgan's Temporomandibular Disorders. And he's been do he was doing this long before almost anybody else. So these chemicals have a, make changes. They can cause allergic edema in the nasal and paranasal sinuses, allergic rhinitis. They can interfere with our sense of smell. That can lead to poor eating habits and nutritional depletion. Now, nutritional depletion is a funny thing because some people will be short and fat or they'll be heavy and other ones don't get enough food. So everybody doesn't react the same. It can be opposite sides of the same coin. So one kid's fat and one's undernourished, but the same problem is the same. It has to do with smell and taste of food and eating habits. All of it leads to a lower resistance to infection. And the eating habits, my great uncle was the first person to isolate vitamin B6, Sam Lukowski. During World War II, he was largely responsible for C and K rations that the army was fed. His last 20 years of his life as a professor emeritus at Berkeley in nutrition and biochemistry, his research was that you could not get the proper nutritional value out of your food without gustatory enjoyment. And those were his words, that the enjoyment and savoring of your food is an essential part of the nutritional process. So now if you look at people in America, where we shove our food down and we eat McDonald's and fast food, and if we go to a restaurant, they have two and three sittings a night, and we're all fat. Not all of us, but a lot of us. 
And then you go and you hear about the Mediterranean diet and the French diet and the Greek diets, and they have more fats. A lot of times they have more fruit. What's the difference? Well, first thing is they eat slow and they do savor their meals. If you go to a restaurant and you're in Italy, you're there for three hours. People aren't rushing to shove food in as fast as possible. So this sense of smell, if we're not smelling well our whole life, it's not something that, oh, we're past that point of development and it's gone. It's how we savor our food. If we come off to the left of the column, those same allergies and chemicals cause a change in the cells in our sinuses and nasal cavities. So we get less cells that make serous and more cells that make mucus. Well, that sums up, what does that mean? Well, the ratio is more mucus secretions. Inside the nose, we have little cilia that move the crud out. If you get too much mucus, the cilia get stuck in the muck and they can't move it out. And then everything that you breathe in, whether it's allergens, bacteria, viruses, foreign bodies comes into the nasal cavity and we can't move it out. Ideally, the cilia would move it into the back of the throat and then we'd swallow it and it would be destroyed in the stomach. If we go to the right, we have the same problem starting with the allergies, but it leads to venous puddling and capillary stagnation. We get cloggy nose, so we open our mouth to breathe which changes our acid-base balance. We, and, it, and as we do this, it changes how the hormones from the pituitary, like growth hormone, lead to optimal growth or less than optimal growth. We may get facial asymmetries. So we, already, we all come back to that middle section. And now we're gonna go off to the right again. And the people with allergies are more prone to sinusitis, headaches, maxillary jaw pain. They also have an open habitus for mouth breathing. If you breathe with your mouth open, then the tongue ends up laying over the posterior teeth. If the tongue overlays the posterior teeth of the mandible, it interferes with eruption. The tongue is also not pushing the teeth out. So if it's not pushing the teeth out, the cheeks are then pushing the teeth in. And this is both the upper and the lower jaw which leads to malocclusion and it leads to changes in our bite, up and down, front and back, side to side rotation in all dimensions. If we go the other way, again, we're starting with that same inflammatory problem. You can get adenoid tissue issues, which can lead to obstruction tube issues. And then we go through bruxism movements to open our eustachian tubes. Well, we already know as adults that if we have a stuffy air and we're on an airplane, we can chew on gum and swallow and it will help correct it. The problem is babies will start to go through these bruxing movements even before they have teeth. They do it to open the eustachian tubes. They don't think about it, they just do it automatically. If you're bruxing as your teeth are coming in, you have excessive forces and you end up with a decreased vertical dimension it gets in the way of the normal development and leads to a malocclusion. So the response that we also get in the middle of the column now, the large turbinates, consular hypertrophy of both um, the palatine and lingual tonsils, and all of these things in all three columns come down to one common problem in children, a nasal pharyngeal airway obstruction. What does it mean? You don't breathe well through your nose. What is normal breathing? Normal breathing is breathing through our nose. When we breathe through our nose, our body makes more nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the strongest anti-inflammatory the body has. If we're mouth breathing, we don't produce as much of it. We also get more accumulation of viruses and bacteria and foreign bodies in our eustachian tubes, and it can lead to middle ear infections. Be nice to have nitric oxide if we're having middle ear infections because it's a strong anti-inflammatory, but because we're breathing through our nose, we don't. Another problem, when there's a middle ear infection, these babies are given antibiotics, sometimes multiple times, over and over and over again. And when they do that, the antibiotics don't only kill the bacteria that are in the middle ear, 
They also kill the healthy bacteria in the gut. So we have a gut biome. The gut biome is an important organ of our whole body. There are many foods and things we eat that are transferred in our, by the bacteria in our gut to fill the nutritional needs we have. There are over 10,000 different bacteria in a healthy biome. That's 10,000 different types of bacteria. And now we start killing off thousands of them. And sometimes ones we don't like will overgrow. And we've interfered with the entire nutritional process of the body because we've overdone these kids on antibiotics. We also make them more likely to have yeast infections and other problems. So all comes down to one common spot again, from the nasal airway obstruction, we get less oxygen saturation. If you get less oxygen saturation, there's less exercise tolerance. You're more prone to behavioral disorders, ADD, ADHD, ODD that we talked about in the beginning. Subpar intellectual achievement on the other side doesn't mean dumb. And I always show this to parents and I make sure they know this. It just means you don't live up to your genetic potential. So I go through this chart with every single parent. I show them pictures of the allergy kids that I'm gonna be showing you. And then I go through it with them and explain where their kids are at. I don't treat young kids anymore, but I send out kids at two, three, four, five, six years old to be treated by somebody who does look at early airway the same way I did for my son. Malaise during quiet periods. So when you get kids in school, these are kids who are daydreaming. They're in their own little world. They don't do as well in school. And an important thing in here that's not listed here, but I'll talk about it. The kids look different. Because they look different, teachers treat them different. And these differences actually make all these other problems worse. So Coming to the bottom of this chart here, you'll see collapse of the maxillal mandibular arches. So everything up to that point was all early childhood development. Coming from the collapse of the maxillal mandibular dental arches going down is the adults. So kids going up, adults coming down. So these adults have high palatal vaults. Again, why? They did not have the tongue widening the maxilla. And as it does it, it causes the roof of the mouth to come down. The roof of the mouth and the floor of the tongue is the same bone. So they have a reduced nasal airway. They have lack of optimal development of the mid face. They also have less room in their mouth for their tongue. They're more prone to have mouth breathing, deviated septums, they have a poor tongue repose, and if you have them bite with their teeth together, you'll see them make the facial grimace when swallowing, and it leads to malocclusion. As you come off to the right, you interfere with posterior eruption of the teeth, so you can get a closed bite, or you can create an open bite where the tongue is always coming through. You do not get optimal development of the jaw. And it leads to cranial mandibular dysfunction. So right here under that line on the right, I put down that 80% of the people in this part are women and they get headaches, neck pain, and I write each one of these down, TMJ, myofascial pain and dysfunction, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, myofascial pain and dysfunction, neck pain, back pain, uh, cramping, and we just list all the different things that women patients get. 80% of those patients are female. We come to the other side though, and basically TMJ or cranial mandibular dysfunction. We come to the other side, and on this side, it's 80% of the patients are male. And these people get changes in the bite as well. They may have mouth breathing. They don't get a good lip seal. They may have problems with chewing. They may have problems with speech but they do have more lip breathing, their tongue's still in the wrong spot between the arches, which leads to more collapse of the arches, a closed bite, chronic mouth breathing, periodontal issues related to it. And finally, they end up with not enough room for their tongue, airway obstruction, snoring and apnea, sleep, sleep cycle disruption, and then 
lowered production of pituitary gland hormones. According to the University of Chicago, that's what makes middle-aged men fat. The same thing that interfered with the growth of the babies is still happening into the adults. And now it's making us become obese or put on that middle, middle body bulge that a lot of men get. Obstructive sleep apnea is less oxygen, can lead all the way to death. We have dysphagia, problems swallowing, gastric reflux, and it's all part of the same issue. So here's the interesting thing. Both the men and the women have the same structure. It's what they complain about. Now, there are estrogen receptors in the TMJ joints, but there are a lot of other differences between men and women. Men have Adam's apple, so they have a little bit smaller airway. But what we do know, when women become older and postmenopausal, they become more like men and they get more snoring and apnea problems. And if you give them estrogen, they kind of come back the other way. But the underlying structure of all these patients is the same. So here's a kid who's a thumb sucker. Well, maybe. This kid turns out, these are pictures from Jim Gary, and you can get them, and this is important, there's a book called The Stigmata of Respiratory Disorders. It was a scope publication. The drug companies passed it out free to doctors, but you can get them through all Jim Gary's pictures, and I show parents all the time, and anytime I can find a few extra copies, I buy them because I give them to pediatricians and I give them to nurses and teachers so they know what to look for. These are kids who aren't good breathers. So this kid's a mouth breather. He, if you look at his shoulders, way out of focus, forward head posture. As I look at these kids, they have jaws that are malocluded. The lower jaw is not as far forward. Is it not as far forward because the maxillary, maxillary arch isn't big enough for it to come forward? I'm going to say an, an awful lot of the time, the answer is yes. If you look, first off, if you look at her shoulders, they're out of focus. She's a mouth breather. She has dark circles under her eyes. The dark circles are blood without enough oxygen. Blood with lots of oxygen is red, doesn't appear dark through the skin. Chin's back, head's tipped forward, but she's actually using her eyes to level her, her field of vision instead of tilting her head at the atlas axis or a little bit of a combination. Eyes are crazy important when we treat TMJ patients. And a lot of times I'll work with a behavioral optometrist because they can help straighten up people's posture. Another one, dark circles under the eyes, head posture, he's distorted. One ear is bigger, one eye, eyebrow, eyelash is hanging down lower. These kids don't look healthy. They don't look right. The dark circles are from backup of fluids. There's not enough blood in the, in the, blood in the capillaries and stuff under the skin, so it looks blue because there's not enough oxygen in that blood. There's usually also a backup in the venous drainage and in the lymph drainage on these kids, making them more prone to infection. If you have a lot of fluid backed up in the sinuses, now you have a hot, warm, moist place with lots of fluid. That's where bacteria love to grow. Middle ear infections. These kids will start to brux their teeth even before they have teeth. They get allergic edema to the mucous membranes. They get stuffiness. They try to move their jaw around to open up their airways. Bruxism may be, a, to a large extent, a learned problem. If you've been moving your jaw around for years to open up your airways, it becomes a habit. Sometimes the reason for the habit can go away, but that doesn't mean the habit will go away. Again, the teeth end up in the balance of forces between the tongue, the lips, the cheeks. Mouth breather. These kids look sometimes dull-witted, not healthy. Shoulders are out of focus. They sometimes look like funny looking kids. They don't look right. So I work with a Dr. Alex Goldman. He started out as a pediatric cardiologist in Russia. And by the time he left Russia, he was in charge of all about a third of sleep in Russia. When he came to the US, he had to go back to medical school to get an American license. He ended up at the University of Chicago the same time Bill DeMent was there and Raz Cartwright was there. <clears throat> 
And then later he went on to be the head of child psych psychiatry at Cook County Hospital. That's the show where they made ER, the TV show. And he calls these kids FLKs. FLK stands for funny looking kids. I didn't always know this. I've worked for him for, with him for probably 25 or 25 years now. Uh, when you look at these kids, they don't look right. So I was at his office doing a lecture. I was gonna do a lecture on how to adjust oral appliances for patients. He had the only school in the state of Illinois teaching sleep tax, how to be sleep tax. And he had these pictures that he was showing them of these FLKs or funny looking kids. And he says, these kids end up, they're more likely to go to prison. They're more likely to be psychotic. And all these medical issues coming from a psychiatrist point of view, except when he was showing these pictures they looked just like the allergy pictures from Dr. Gary. Sad look. She looks like she's ready to break out in tears, mouth breathe, their heads way forward, out of focus. This one looks like she's in pain. If I looked at somebody and saw them like this, I'd ask her, oh, do you have bad pain in your right temple and behind your right eye? She tips her head to that side. She rotates her head to tighten up the trapezius there. This looks like a headache patient with temporal pain on that side. She's a mouth breather. She's got dark circles under her eyes. The shoulders are way forward and the shoulders are at a different height. This kid's all twisted out of shape. You can just see him being made fun of in the playground. Dark circles, he's overclosed. It's almost like the facial grimace when swallowing you see here. His ear is one sticks way out, his head's twisted out to the side. All of these kids, they just don't look right. They don't look healthy. They should be more or less symmetrical and they're not. This one's in pain. You'll see the corrugator muscles between his eyes all creased up. Corrugator muscles, when you have those creases, people think you're angry. So there's a book out called Blink. I suggest everybody should read it because we make our decisions in, the, in a blink of an instant. And it talks about how decisions are sometimes made about people in the first second you've seen them. So now if you see this person, you're gonna say, I don't want him, he's angry. He's, so it, it's important, facial impressions, the impressions we make from looking at somebody's face, that first impression never ever goes away. I was doing a, this lecture my, for my first time in South America and all my pictures were American pictures. So I went on the internet to find pictures of kids in South America. Very narrow underdeveloped mouth, dark circles under the eyes, dark circles under the eyes, forward head posture, class, severe class two. The kids don't look right. They look just like the kids from the American kids do. And just like Harvold's monkeys didn't look right. They're not developing right. It can be at a very young age and they have dark circles. The upper lip is elevated to help them breathe, a mouth breather. These kids mouth breather, tongues in the wrong spot. So forward head posture, why do we have it? Because it helps us breathe. It's an accommodation. Things are crowded, but when we put our head forward, we can breathe better. You can see it on the x-rays, the American Academy of Applied Myofunctional Sciences. They work with kids to retrain their muscles. If we're gonna to try to correct things, but we don't retrain the bad habits that put us there in the first place, we're gonna end up having relapse. We gotta look at tongue ties. If the kids are tongue tied, they can't develop normally. And the earlier you relieve a tongue tie, the better. Ideally at birth, if there's a tongue tie, before the mother is given the baby to breastfeed, the first thing you do is you just cut the tongue tie. It turns out all around the world, Midwives used to keep a thumbnail sharpened like a razor blade. And when a newborn baby was born, they would cut the tongue tie and then immediately give mom the baby to breastfeed. The baby could breastfeed. In a more civilized world, when we couldn't breastfeed, we didn't give them bottles, but we had wet nurses. Sometimes it would be a family member, somebody else who was breastfeeding. If you were wealthy, you might have a maid that was also breastfeeding her children and she'd breastfeed yours. 
But we knew, and they knew a long time ago, that the best way to get normal development is breastfeeding. This kid can't breastfeed. This kid, they can't push the tongue up and smash the nipple against the roof of the mouth because they can't get their tongue that high. You see the typical heart shape where when they try to lift their tongue, it looks like the shape of a, the top of a heart. This one sticks their tongue out. It doesn't go straight out, it goes down. It's got the tongue tie again. Anchoglossia, a tongue tie. This is a little baby. You can see the heart shape in the tongue. This is a crying baby. They can't get their tongue up at all. So if you're treating children and they have obstructive sleep apnea, absolutely positively, they should have a follow-up polysomnography to, to assess response to treatment. Home sleep tests are not currently indicated for children or adolescents. So if you're treating them, you should have polysomnography before and after rapid maxillary expansion to make sure that we have gotten rid of the disease or what the level of residual disease is. Practice parameters for respiratory indications for polysomnography. So all the kids, if their kids should have it, Dr. Gazal, University of Chicago, he's looking at kids and his conclusions on behavior, neurocognition, attention, memory, intelligence. All these things are developing in the first seven years of life and seven years of age is the high end cutoff to prevent permanent changes, including to the anatomy. So his seven years age said, if you took the tonsils and adenoids out before age seven, just like we saw historically, there would be a return to normal in the anatomy. But that does not mean the brain behavior will catch up. I have great guilt because when my son was three years old, I could recognize all these problems happening in him, except the doctors told me he didn't need his tonsils and adenoids out. It wasn't a problem. I didn't act. I didn't, I should have acted sooner, but I didn't act till my son was screened to start school and he was five years old and they told me he had ADD, ADHD, he couldn't start kindergarten and they wanted to put him on a Ritalin for the rest of his life. I pretty much said, are you crazy? I took him to Rush Medical School where Dr. Cartwright was, who's pretty much the mother of dental sleep medicine. And turned out he had a sleep apnea index of 60. However, I was an overconcerned parent. Dr. Cartwright listened to me and all my stuff. And in her chart, which I later looked at when I became an assistant professor under Dr. Cartwright, her initial impression was overconcerned parent. So sometimes even the people who know what's going on will do things wrong. So I wish I would have had my son in at three years old, not five years old. However, my son who couldn't start kindergarten ended up graduating college, double major, double minor, magna cum laude with honors. But two years of important brain development were lost to apnea. That you can't get back and there's no way to measure it. Pediatric obstructive apnea and critical role of oral facial growth. Hypotonia, hypotonia, the features lead to it. This is 2012. It was done with Christian G. Lameau, who recommends that everybody with sleep disordered breathing in children should always have oral myofunctional therapy re-education as part of it. In another article, he also said the same for adults. They should have training of their tongue. There's lots of different training of the tongue. So I work with oral myofunctional therapists. Before there was oral myofunctional therapists in the US, we had, there were oral myologists. That's who originally taught the oral myofunctional therapists. There's in England, the doc, Dr. Mew and Dr. Mew were doing orthotropics. We can train and control the movement of the tongue and the mouth to improve development. If we don't correct these old bad habits, they will tend to cause a relapse. There is nobody as qualified as a dentist to diagnose the developmental problems caused the, that cause sleep apnea. Lifelong problems can be avoided with early intervention. It's our job. 
I no longer treat kids, I only treat adults. So I'm not treating the kids, but every adult who comes in, I ask them, do they have kids? Do you have grandkids? Do you have nieces? Do you have nephews? And I go through that entire lecture that we just went through, a brief form of it. I show them the pictures and I tell them the pathways because every kid out there needs to be caught and corrected. Every time I get a teacher or a principal in my office, I take the same thing, I ask them for their time and I teach it to them. I've lectured at PTAs and I've lectured in other places, but the kids are the most important of all. And seven is the cutoff. We really wanna get them before they're seven years old. Better to get them at three or four. I send a lot of kids to Kevin Boyd, who does orthotropics here in, in the Chicago area. Um, thank God he's there, otherwise I'd have to be treating all these little kids and I much prefer treating adults. The Journal of the American Dental Association did a cover story on oral and general health benefits of breastfeeding. This includes jaw development for the kids, but it also improves, it decreases risk for things like breast cancer and other problems for the mother. So it's healthy for the mother and the baby both. When we talk about reflexes, the tip of the tongue reflex, somebody comes in with a chipped tooth and their tongue's all sore from playing with the chip. That's what's called the tip of the tongue reflex or the tongue to tongue reflex. It's also called the nursing reflex. When the mother puts her breasts in the baby's mouth for the first time, the tongue touches the nipple and it responds with a protrusive reflex and then the baby gets rewarded with milk. And what starts off as a hardwired reflex will eventually become a learned reflex and the babies learn how to optimize nursing and feeding. But again, it starts as a hardwired reflex and that reflex never goes away. Rapid maxillary expansion and growing patients. You get a three dimensional airway increase. It increases the total volume, oxygen saturation and decreases apnea hypopnea indexes. So we've talked about the treatment and the background important on this one, adenotonsillar ablation leads to sensation of mouth breathing and progressive restoration of normal facial development facilitated by orthodontics. Rapid maxillary expansion on its own at an early age may actually cause the adenoids and tonsils to shrink up on their own, but they will definitely, if you, once you've expanded a kid and at three years old, it's very fast, they are a better surgical risk because they have a better airway. Cardiovascular and sleep-related consequences of temporal mandibular disorders. This came out in 2001 by the National Insti Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. They talk about the fact that the way the jaw develops affects every single part of our body. It's huge. You need to know this. Um, in 1998, Shimshak had an article in Cranio talking about patients having TMJ disorders had a 300% increase in medical expense in every single field of medicine. This came out three years later. I'm gonna tell you my feeling is the sleep-related and air-related consequences of TMJ disorders are largely responsible for much of that increase in spending mm -hmm. in other medical fields. Epigenetic changes. So epigenetic are environmental changes. They can be acquired. They can be passed on generation to generation. It's not the same as changing genes that can take thousands of years, but it can pass. So if a baby, a female baby is born, all the eggs that that, that baby will have as an adult female are already there when the baby's born. So the grandmother's epigenetics are affecting the grandchildren. Changing paternal grandmother's early food supplies influence, influence the cardiovascular mortality of female grandchildren. So this is a multi-generational epigenetic change. We talked about smell. Parental olfactory experience influences behavioral and neural structure in subsequent generations. 
the olfactory experiences, those are the ones you can't have if you have swollen nasal cavities that we talked about at the very top of Dr. Gary's chart. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. This is actually the fifth time I recorded it, and I'm hoping it actually is here this time. I've been having problems. So thank you very much.